what I view as one of the most important challenges that you have going forward, and that is building a stronger partnership between researchers and managers. And I was incredibly fortunate in Hawaii to fall under the mentorship of Gene Kreidler, who at that time was the only non-research scientist or non-research biologist in the employee of the Fish and Wildlife Service in Hawaii. One refuge manager, two research biologists in the islands, and that was it. Think about that compared to what the infrastructure is out there right now. So that research partnership between researchers and managers so that we get the questions right and provide you with the answers that you really need. And so the question I'm going to put to you today is National Wildlife Refuge System 2103. Where will it be? What will it contain? And what are you going to do to make it happen? And sort of in preparation for thinking about that question, I want you to think about a place you love. What was it when you first came to know it? What did it mean to you? What is it today? And what are your hopes and dreams for that particular parcel? And then extend that thinking to the National Wildlife Refuge System as a whole. And that's the challenge that we have in front of us. Keeping, our first challenge is gonna be keeping our current, maintaining the integrity, diversity, and health of our current assets. And other preliminary comments, these sorts of endeavors, research is not a solitary endeavor, and nor has this one been. And I'd like to thank Pat Heglin, a good friend and colleague who is really, she, Andy Loringer, uh, Dan Ash have really th uh, shaped, and Jim Kurth have really shaped the way I think about refuges and what the right questions might be. Okay, National Wildlife System. You have a vision in the uh, Promises document. And these are the principles that emerged from that discussion at Keystone. What you don't have is a conservation target. You know, what is it going to be? It's pretty broad right now. And I think what you're doing here today is coming up with a more specific vision of what you want the refuge system to be in 2103. And you've done a lot of heavy lifting to uh, set the table for this project. Think of the, uh, you have the Strategic Habitat Conservation uh, Handbook, uh, the principles of strategic habitat conservation, adaptive management, uh, decision-making workshops, a number of uh, documents on climate change. You've really been thinking out of the box, and in many ways, especially with respect to climate change, you're sort of leading the discussion among the agencies with SAP 4.4, the EPA document on climate change, adaptations in the National Wildlife Refuge System, and other documents. And not the least of these documents is fulfilling the promise. Okay? Historically, the, the story of Pelican Island has been told and retold numerous times in, uh, at this meeting, but the, I'd like to use this slide to illustrate that the challenges facing the National Wildlife Refuge System have evolved over time. Initially, they were local in, in nature, over harvest of birds and mammals in particular locations, and the response was uh, individual refuges like Pelican Island National Wildlife Refuge. In the 30s, you had a situation very similar to today in that you had an economic crisis, the Great Depression, and an ecological crisis, uh, the loss of wetlands, and the Dust Bowl era. And as part of that were declining waterfowl numbers. In response to that, in 1934, the Beck Report came out, a, record, a report that was requested by Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the other Roosevelt that had played a very large part in the history of the National Wildlife Refuge System. And that was authored by Aldo Leopold, Ding Darling, and Ira Gabelson. 
while that's a fairly general document, Gabrielson and Ding Darling use that to craft a vision that we'll talk about here in a little bit, a vision that has carried three generations of fish and wildlife professionals uh, forward. In the 60s, endangered species started to emerge as an issue. You had the Endangered Species Preservation Act that gave you the authority to purchase lands to protect threatened and endangered species. Currently, you have 59 or 61. I never can get that number right because I get a different answer depending on which source I seek out. But refuges established specifically for, national, for threatened and endangered species. And the good news about those refuges, based on work that was done at the University of Idaho by Emmy Blades, a graduate student, is species for which in, uh, refuges were established do better than threatened and endangered species overall. In other words, if you put your attention on it, you are making a difference. Uh, in the 1990s, there was a call for change in management. And you had the 1997 Refuge Improvement Act. And it, uh, here in the last decade, it's been climate and land use change that have really come to the fore. And I mention both of those because the changes that you're going to see on the landscape in land use, loss of habitat, loss of connectivity, is going to occur at a faster scale than is climate change. And so we need to think about both of those as threats. And then your challenge is to come up with a new vision for how you're going to respond to these new challenges. Originally, the challenges were local and the responses were local. I would suggest that now we have threats that are globally driven and it's going to require bolder thinking about what the scale of our response is going to be. We need to think outside the refuge boundaries. Okay, in the 30s, the, the Beck Report, what came out of that was a bold vision by Ding Darling, Ira Gabelson, that they pushed really hard for a national wildlife refuge system that would maintain recreationally viable populations of waterfowl for the future enjoyment of the American public. And you did a world-class job. We have a refuge system for 44 species of waterfowl that has, meets all the principles of representation, redundancy, and resilience. And we, don't, we have refuges that, for waterfowl in each of their seasons of occurrences in the United States and across their full geographical, geophysical, and ecological range. And in the long term, that may be the single biggest advantage that the refuge system has for waterfowl. You have provided them with secure habitat across their full geographical, geophysical, and ecological range. And as a result, you have multiple populations that are able to, where the organisms are able to adapt and evolve in response to changing environmental conditions. You haven't put all your eggs in one basket. The median, well, we'll get to that later, but the median number of refuges for each uh, species of waterfowl, uh, refuge occurrences is 116. Each species of waterfowl, the median level of occurrence is 116. So this was a vision that carried, that went from 1934, I would argue, through the 70s and early 80s. Now let's look at what the refuge system is, or let's look at the larger system, the protected area systems of the United States, and what they are in geophysical space. And what we have here is elevation, lower elevations to higher elevations. And what we have here is soil, higher productivity or lower productivity. The protected areas are concentrated at high elevations and on poor soil. Writ large, the protected area system in the United States has done a heck of a job of protecting rocks and ice. <laughs> but the refuges are different. When you look here from elevation, low to high, 
and soil productivity high or low, you have a large number of refuges that are lower elevations and on richer soils. Exactly the places where you get the highest biodiversity. Okay? So you are different as a system than the protected area system writ large. And I think that's a strength that you can build on. Okay, the refuges are not distributed uniformly across the country. You have a predilection for coastal areas. I can identify with that. I grew up on the coast in Southern California. I like the coast. But this is how your refuges are distributed geographically. This is the number of refuges poor uh, uh, by ecoregion. I'll show you later the number of refuges by LCC, which is sort of a current dimension for doing this type of analysis. But again, you're concentrated in coastal regions for really good reasons. Because these are, are areas that are important to the species that you've established refuges for. This is the median size. Again, the median size of refuges, and this is just the lower 48. The Alaskan refuges, there are only, what, less than a dozen of them? Sixteen. Sixteen. Uh, while small in number, are large in size by orders of magnitude. But we'll deal with the lower 48. And except for the arid lands down here in the southwest, you can see that most of the refuges are uh, less than, uh, certainly less than 5,000. Uh, hectares in size. Okay. So the question is, you know, is that really sufficient in terms of size? And we'll come back to that question. But again, an uneven distribution geographically. And this is uh, breaking out the refuge system and uh, or the protected area status of different LCCs, <coughs> desert, we just broke out uh, five of them here, just to compare and contrast. But this is a number of ecological systems as mapped by uh, USGS and NatureServe, the GAP program in USGS. So you have the Great Plains with 102 ecological systems and the Gulf uh, Coast Plains and Ozarks with 148. The number of ecological systems unique to each of these uh, LCCs varies from none in the eastern tall grass prairie big rivers uh, LCC to 17 in the coastal plains. So that sort of suggests again that biodiversity is unevenly distributed or you know across the landscape as well. Something to think about. But then when you look at the area protected, you go from less than 1% in the Great Plains where many of the uh, birds in the Great Plains, the grassland birds, are declining. Le but less than 1% of that landscape is in protected area status. To uh, the desert areas, the low elevation areas, but low productivity soils, uh, where 17% has been set aside. Now this last table shows the percentage of, they, of each of these LCCs that is either in protected area status or public ownership. Why do we want to look at that? Well, what that tells you, gives you some indication of, is there perhaps a public land solution to conserving the underprotected ecological systems in that area? In eastern tall grass prairie of big rivers, it looks to me like a private land solution. If you're going to uh, increase the protection uh, in that area, it's going to be working with private partners. It's not going to be working as much with public partners. But if you're looking at the desert areas and want to get to a higher level of protection than 12% of the area, Many of the underprotected ecological systems in that area are on public lands, and so you have the opportunity for either a public partnership or a transfer of public properties from one agency to another. 
Okay, land uh, cover surrounding national wildlife refuges. This brings home a point that I think you already know. This is based on work, uh, PhD research conducted by Leon, Leona Swansera at the University of Idaho. It just gives you an idea of the percent of anthropogenic cover within 10 kilometers of a national wildlife refuge system. For 40% of your holdings, greater than 50% of the adjacent lands are in some form of anthropogenic cover. Okay. That provides opportunities for partnerships, but it also presents some challenges in terms of connectivity at that individual refuge to other protected areas in the system. Okay. Thinking about how much is enough. Remember the median sizes of the refuge, many of them under 5,000 hectares or under 1,000 hectares. Uh, Brian Check from the service uh, did some studies that found that 58% uh, of endangered species are supported on the refuge system at, vial, at genetically viable levels. Okay. Whereas 43% are supported on refuges at evolutionarily viable levels. And then the reason for that is many of those are, uh, that's not a smaller figure, I think is that many of the endangered species are plants and animals. When you just look at this for vertebrates, this figure shrinks to less than 10%. So it will, the answer to the question of how much is enough is going to vary depending on the species area of these that you have. This gives you an idea of the, of the refuges, the number of refuges that are different sizes and various ecological processes. But at the end of the day, if you're talking about species migrations and species extinction, most of the refuges are too small to maintain uh, evolutionary potential for species or uh, migrations. Again, suggesting that partnerships are going to be increasingly important for you. Okay. Bottom line, refuges are insufficient with climate change. They're too small, they're too fragmented, they're often embedded in inhospitable matrices, and they are not large enough to accommodate it, ex uh, expect to accommodate expected biome shifts. Jumping back to look at, this shows you five, five ecological systems as mapped by, map, by GAP and NatureServe. Okay, these are the five systems here. And the diamonds are the the percentage show you that this, and this is the percent protected, and this is the percentage here that are in protected areas one and two currently. The blue diamond shows you what happens when you consider other public lands. And this is an arbitrary uh, policy threshold, if you will, of 20%. And it shows how many would get above that. Uh, with a shift towards, and what you find is that the riparian or wetland species, you can really do a lot with a public land solution. Uh, you can do a whole lot uh, with shrubland step habitats as a public land solution. This is for five ecological systems. The first level of, of thematic resolution for nature sir. This shows, this line right here shows the one-to-one -one threshold. In other words, this is the percent of where the percent occurrence of a, ve of a vegetation type is equal to uh, the percent protected. Okay. These are the three levels of ecological organization. Level one has eight vegetative ecological systems, level two has 52, and level three has 512. Eco different ecological systems. And these are the percent of those ecological systems that have achieved 12% or more protection. 
Okay. Now, before our prior to this, on the previous slide, I used 20%, arbitrary and capricious figure. Okay. The 12% is at least thought to be a rational figure by Canada. That's the national standard that they set for protected areas in Canada. They wanted 12% of Canada in protected area status. So using that threshold, 17% of the protected areas at the uh, <coughs> level one of ecological classification achieved that 12% threshold. Uh, if you go to public lands, you can achieve 100% protection of the first level of ecological classification. If you go to the second level, which is uh, quite a few more ecological systems, 53% meet the 12% threshold in protected areas, and you can get to 98%. So most of it can be covered with a public land solution. But when you get down to the type of level that you would map on an individual refuge, the 500 12 ecological systems, only 45% meet that threshold, and only 76% have a public land solution. And most of those without a public land solution are in the eastern United States. No big surprise. Okay, moving ahead. We know what we have, at least for ecological systems, and we know what we have in geophysical space. But we really lack hard information on what species occur in the National Wildlife Refuge System. And that, I think, is going to be your biggest challenge in inventorying what you have. And you've launched a very uh, bold initiative on inventory and monitoring that I think will go a long way towards solving the problem. But it's going to be a challenge. So the first step is to establish a vision for the refuge system. What is your vision, a vision bold, as bold as was put forth by Ding Darling and Ira Gableson in the 30s? What do you see as a vision for the National Wildlife Refuge System for the next 75 years? What's it going to be? Is it going to be dragonflies? Is it going to be uh, mussels, freshwater species? You fall back and just focus on one of your other trust responsibilities, which is endangered species, and say every refuge from, from this day forth will be established for an endangered species, a threatened or endangered species. You can get into a lot of dogfights in house and out of house about making that decision. I would suggest that you think not only of species, but think about ecological systems as well. So that you're, when you're trying to protect species, you're also trying to protect underprotected ecological systems. You get a bigger bang for your buck, you bring along species that we don't even know that they're there because we have an inventory of them. So again, establish a, a vision for the refuge system, identify your conservation targets, and then conduct a gap analysis of the conservation targets on refuge lands and all other protected areas all other protected areas, because the refuge system is a small part of the larger protected area system in the United States. And I'm going to give you some examples later on where a gap in the refuge system is not a gap in, in the national uh, protected area system. Okay. Then step two, after you've done your inventory and your, and your gap analysis, uh, you need to determine representation and redundancy within landscape conservation cooperatives across the full geographical, geophysical, ecological ranges of your conservation targets. Again, the reason for doing that is I would argue that the single biggest tool we have in the face of climate change is the ability of the organisms themselves to adapt and evolve to changing conditions. That's the single biggest tool we have. And what will give them the greatest chance to do that is secure habitat. It starts with secure habitat. It doesn't always end with secure habitat, as you well know, because you have to heavily manage habitats as well. But it starts with secure habitat. And again, if you're looking for a model, you only have to look back to what you have accomplished already for waterfowl and shorebirds 
to see a world-class model, the gold standard, for what a refuge system should be for a particular conservation target. There's representation, there's redundancy, and there's resilience built into that system. Or waterfall. And then strategically fill the gaps in coverage of conservation targets where possible in ecological systems which themselves are underprotected. So it's not just the species, it's the ecosystems in which those species occur. Measures of success, I've already said it. This is based on work by Mark Schaefer, Bruce Stein. Uh, that was reported out initially in Precious Heritage. How many of you have a copy of Precious Heritage? Take a look at it. And I would suggest to you that you might want to think about doing a similar book for the refuge system. Because you, do, you are the keepers of a, some of America's most precious heritage, and it's on the refuge system. So measure success, representation, that's easy enough, one of everything. But going back to what the blueprint that we have from Waterfowl, it was not just a, enough to have one, one refuge established for, say, mallards in the United States. You wanted at least one refuge for mallards in each of the uh, flyways in which that occurred, okay? And that gets you to redundancy. So the answer to the representation redundancy question varies with the scale at which you answer the question. Redundancy is you want to have more than one refuge established for a particular conservation target so you don't have all your eggs in one basket. Okay, as I pointed out earlier, it's going to be critically important when we're thinking about climate change. And resilience, you want those refuges to be large enough, either through fee ownership or partnerships, leveraging management, you know, success through partnerships, to maintain the integrity, diversity, and health of those individual populations. Okay, again, the gold standard for, is waterfowl in the National Wildlife Refuge System multiple secure habitats in each of the flyways and each of the seasons of occurrence for each species of waterfowl. And the median number of refuges on which ducks and geese are found is 119. 119. For shorebirds, it's 149. You have, if, you know, if you think about this as a stamp collection, your album for waterfowl and marsh bird are full. Now my question to you, what's your next area of specialty? Or is this good enough to fall back and maintain your current assets? And make sure that you maintain the integrity, diversity, and health of the National Wildlife Refuge System for shorebirds and, and uh, waterfowl, or marsh birds and waterfowl. Those species for which you have done the best job and stand as a model to the rest of the world of what can be achieved. Okay, again, this shows you what we've got for waterfowl, bird species on refuge. This is based on some work done by David Roop, uh, Pat Heglin, uh, Anna Pedgorna at the University of Idaho, and myself looking at using checklists from the refuge system. Uh, looking at the number of occurrences of these bird species, from, uh, waterfowl, shorebirds, waterbirds, and landbirds, for the refuges. So this is a number of waterfowl that have at least one occurrence is 95% for on refuges. Uh, and you look at the least protected, it's going to be over here at least one occurrence, you do a very good job of getting at least one stamp, you know, maybe. Now, this is what, uh, these are the results for the national park system. So we looked at the occurrence of, the, of species of waterfowl, shorebirds, waterbirds, and landbirds in the National Wildlife Refuge System. We looked at it in the national park system as well. And what came out of that is increased 
representation and redundancy for in each of those categories when you consider the two systems uh, by themselves. I mean, two systems together. Looks like, with one exception, would be water with shorebirds. It looks like the two systems cover shorebirds equally, uh, which is a little bit of a surprising result. But when you're looking at uh, the median 116 occurrences, that should be 119, uh, only 40% of the bird, uh, land birds achieve that level of redundancy in the system. Okay. This is flyway representation for a number of species of uh, waterfowl, and you can see that there are multiple refuges in which these species occur in each of the flyways of occurrence. Again, we're getting that redundancy. Birds of conservation concern, if you look at, uh, which is a national standard that you've stated is going to be one of your guidelines for making management decisions, 93% of the birds of conservation concern have at least one occurrence in refuges and parks. Three quarters of them have at least five occurrences, but only 30% have achieved 116 occurrences. Okay? The waterfall standard. Now, for some species, you don't need 116, 119 refuges to have adequate uh, redundancy. I mean, think about Lace Antille. It's endemic to the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, at least now. Originally, it was endemic to all of Hawaii. Uh, but it's a narrow endemic, therefore maybe just two or three refuges would do it. You've achieved redundancy for that species by doing a translocation from Laysan to Midwood. But if you look at uh, the number of occurrences of breeding obligates, you can break this out any way you want. This is habitat obligates as reported out by the State of the Birds report for 2011. And again, the amount of redundancy varies. The ocean birds have the least amount of redundancy. And the boreal forest birds have the greatest amount of redundancy in the national parks and national wildlife refuges. Okay, least protected ecological systems, grasslands and arid lands. Across the country, these are the least uh, protected ecological systems. Okay. Grasslands, 55% of the grassland birds have uh, experienced significant declines in numbers. Uh, for arid lands, it's 70%, 76% of the habitat obligates on arid lands are declining. 48% uh, of the birds of conservation concern on grasslands are declining and 39% of the uh, of those occurring on arid lands. Okay. There are opportunities there. Here for the arid lands, there are large acreages of arid lands that are publicly owned. There's very little in the in grassland ecosystems that is publicly owned. So these are these present the challenge of different management opportunities, different partnership opportunities, if you will. Different answers to the question of how would you strategically grow the National Wildlife Refuge System to protect grasslands versus arid lands. So it's going to require different thinking in these different ecological systems. Okay, we talked about gaps. You, as you go through the system, you say, all right, this species is not found on the National Wildlife Refuge System. Therefore, let's go out and create a new National Wildlife Refuge for it. Okay? Well, one of the species not found on the National Wildlife Refuge System is Xanthus muro. It's a uh, seabird, alcid, uh, dominant part of its range is in Baja, California, but it gets up into Southern California. It is not found on a single National Wildlife Refuge. However, it is found on Anacapa, Santa, uh, Santa Barbara, and Santa Cruz Islands. 
all three of which are in the Channel Islands National Park. And most recently, they have managed to eliminate rats and cats from Anacapa Island. So uh, the Park Service is managing this species very effectively. So rather than a gap that needs to be filled, this is a conservation partnership. The other leg of this conservation partnership would be DOD because there is a small breeding population of Xanthus murals on San Clemente Island that is currently uh, managed by U.S. Navy and SEAL Team. That's a management partnership opportunity, I would suggest. So that would have to be done for every species. Figure out what your opportunities are, where your partnerships lie. So bottom line, a gap in the, in the refuge system may not be a gap in the larger American conservation landscape, but an opportunity for partnership. The challenge is climate, land use change, human population of uh, 450 million in the United States, that's sort of the median number. It goes as high as uh, three quarters of a billion. Uh, declining number of traditional users, 80% or more than that, actually Emily Sheffield indicated this morning that, or this afternoon that it was actually 85% of population in urban areas. We are an indoor nation and we have changing attitudes about recreation, wild areas, and wildlife in general. Those are going to be challenges. And a lot of what I've seen come out of this meeting is you're facing up to those challenges, but it's, it's huge. Okay. Heinz National Wildlife Refuge. That could be the refuge of the future. How do you get a bog turtle from here to anywhere where it can make a living? Okay. That's going to be a challenge. So adjacent areas may be more important to maintaining, to determining the integrity, diversity, and health of populations on your refuge than the activities inside the refuge itself. This is work done by Patrick Gonzalez, uh, recently published, that shows very quickly high vulnerability to low vulnerability to climate change. This is projected biome shifts across the North America over the next hundred years. And what you see there, just looking at the red areas, or focus on the green, is the challenges that the different regions, because these are the different regions of the Fish and Wildlife Service, the challenges that the different regional managers are going to be facing differ <coughs> dramatically. This is at a very coarse scale, and we're just looking high vulnerability, low vulnerability, a biome shift. The chance that your refuge is currently grasslands will be, say, forest lands 100 years from now. Or that you've got a coastal marsh refuge that is going to be really good habitat for diving ducks in 100 years. The, the chance that the biome that you're current, the ecological systems that you're currently managing for will dramatically change in the next hundred years. And that, those are the numbers. Okay. How do we move forward? Where do we get the big space for a buck? I would suggest that your biggest challenge is to secure your existing assets. Increase the ecological footprint and resilience of, the uh, of your refuge and therefore increase the resilience of your populations to change and reduce stress from non-climatic factors. For current assets, enhance habitat quality and quantity. And you're already doing that on many refuges. Uh, you're restoring habitat. This is going to be really important. So to the extent possible, increase uh, the habitat quality and, and habitat availability on each of your current holdings. And restoration is really going to be important. Think about what they're doing. Jim Krause and his group is doing up at Hakla Forest National Wildlife Refuge, which is one of my favorite refuges, in terms of restoring native co-op. And they're building habitat, and the endangered birds are returning to those habitats after a period of 10, 20 years. 
Increased representation, redundancy, resilience, and connectivity on the current National Wildlife Refuge System. Again, we're dealing with current assets. Ecological integrity. And these are comments from various individuals. It is certain that the park and reserve system uh, of the United States will be totally inadequate for conservation of the products of 4 billion years of evolution. A new ecocentric uh, paradigm is needed. Organisms themselves and their ability to adapt and evolve to change in environmental conditions are going to be important. As we move forward, we really need a bold vision of what the refuge system will be. And again, I think if we're thinking about, we can't think of individual properties, we have to think of a system, and we have to think of the full breadth of ecological opportunities out there. This one I particularly like because at the end of the day, that is what you're saving, particularly in the face of climate change and shifting biomes. You're saving dirt. The geophysical underpinnings of the refuges are the enduring uh, conservation features, if you will. I think we're going to have to think about conserving ecological systems at three levels of, of ecological organization. The enduring physical features, the geophysical, okay, the uh, ecological, and the organisms themselves. Because all three are needed to make it work. And if we think about representation redundancy for each of those features, then I think we have a solid foundation on which to move forward into the next century. Dan Asher spots refuges are providing habitat for millions and millions of waterfowl. The bridges to support the migration of neotropical songbirds and shorebirds were supporting the recovery of species that are coming back from the brink of extinction. And that's supported by the numbers. If you establish, for those refuges that you, for those species for which you have established a national wildlife refuge, the threatened and endangered ones, they have a much better chance of recovering than do, than do the endangered species writ large. And in Sam Hamilton, we need to be able to say about the refuge system, okay, we have a blueprint how to build this landscape. Now the challenge is to get out and build it. Well, that blueprint is, the event, is, is your vision for the refuge system that should emerge from this meeting. Something to match the bold thinking of Ding Darling and, and, Gab and Gabrielson, where they wanted a national wildlife refuge system to sustain recreationally viable populations of waterfowl for the future, Ameri uh, for the future enjoyment of the American public. What words would you substitute in there for your vision for the National Wildlife Refuge System 2103. Thank you very much. I think we probably have time for questions. Yes. Right. And you, and you don't deal with acres and you're not dealing with populations. But, I mean, do you feel any need for us to do the assessment of what this translate refuges into populations of any species? Well, that's the next level. I mean, and, and occurrence is not necessarily a self sustaining population. So that's something to think about. So the next thing would be to look at all right, it occurs here. But does it occur, is the habitat available to it on that refuge large enough to sustain a viable population? For some species, the answer will be yes. For others, it will be no. But the first, the first cut is, is it here? And if it is here, then you've got the how much is enough question. Yeah. Yes? Um, you've done a lot can, you, can you use the microphone? Yeah. Okay. Threats. Um, so climate change is one threat. You had a map up there showing the likelihood of biome shift. You showed uh, a picture of a refuge surrounded by urbanized area. That's another threat. Uh, I see refuges pouring a lot of money into invasives. And I, 
I wonder if you've seen anything or have done any kind of analysis, the kind of analysis that you do that looks at the system as a whole and looks at priorities or um, rankings across the system in terms of invasives. And because when I see the work that's being done with invasives, the threat of invasives relative to other threats and then the threats of certain kinds of invasives relative to each other, I don't see that kind of analysis. And I think it's important that we have that kind of analysis because I see a lot of resources being spent on the problem of invasives. And I'm curious. I think a threat, you know, it's a challenge. It's with an endangered species. What's the threat that, you know, you've got more threats than you probably deal with. So which is the threat that you can manage where you're going to make a difference for it and where, all, where you have some hope of making, you know, controlling it. And also the threat that will give you some reproductive release for, the, for your population. So that's the type of analysis that needs to be done. Uh, there's been some work that was funded by CERTA uh, that has looked at that at the University of Idaho and the University of uh, Maryland both have looked at that and looking at uh, a threat and then management of that threat and then a demographic response by a species. Okay. Having said that, one of the biggest challenges to doing that work was coming up with information that documented the relationship between a threat and the demographic uh, parameters of the species, reproductive rate, reproductive success. We have very few studies out there that link those two. And we have, similarly, we have very few studies that link a management action to the demographic rates of a species. And I think it's time to change that, if we're going to be effective managers. Because we have a limited amount of money, and we need to be able to say, what's going to give us the biggest thing for a problem? Doctor, we have to wrap her up. We have to wrap it up now, I guess. Uh, we're all due back in the exhibit hall uh, at 4.30. I want to thank Dr. Scott for the uh, very uh, provoking uh, presentation. <laughs>